Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. Uh, yeah. Um, and thanks also to Tim, with whom I swap, so you can ignore the last bullet there. I assumed that was going to be the presentation standing between everybody and their lunch. So what we're going to talk about is what's the problem with scalability with databases? Um, if everybody agrees there's no problem, I think we just found ourselves another hour and we can get back on schedule. Uh, what is elastic virtualization, which is what I'm going to be talking about? Uh, elastic, what's part elastic? And, uh, by way of introduction, I'm one of the two founders of the company. Uh, we've been around for a couple of years now, and we do database stuff. So hang in there, and we'll talk something about it. So how many of you here have run into a situation where you're running an app with MySQL, and uh, your app gets really successful, and then your database kind of uh, gets slow? Two people. Good. Um, so obviously there's there's a problem. Nobody else had this problem. Don't you don't use MySQL. What database do you use? Uh, PostgreSQL. Never had this problem with Postgres. How big of a server did you run it on? Not, we didn't really expand it that much. So okay. So one of the important things about scalability challenges is you need to have a problem of scale. If you have very little data or very few users, you don't have a scalability problem. But if you do, and this is, by the way, a standard syspec style benchmark, uh, transaction time on the, uh, oh, these slides are up on, um, on my blog. There's a PDF there, so feel free to download it, even if you, uh, if you want to take pictures with me, that's better. The slides are not that good to take pictures of. Uh, as you have more people connecting to your system, your response time goes off the cliff. This is very standard with MySQL, with uh, reasonably large systems. The reason for this is traditional relational databases are very, very good when you can scale up. But when you have situations like concurrency, your database has to guarantee something like ACID, and you get into trouble. Uh, you really want your database to be operating at this performance level. You really don't want it operating at that performance. That's basically the idea. Um, so why does all this matter? Uh, if you're running an application, which is the kind that most people have on the web, uh, there are external factors which you can't really control. Uh, there's a guy who decides he wants to quit. There's another guy who decides he wants to take his shirt off. And before you know it, your website's going totally crazy. Uh, and you have these kinds of things where you have a flash sale. You want to do your sale for one hour. You want to do your sale for six hours, something like that. Um, interesting side note, a customer of ours is a flash sale company. Uh, they would ideally like to do all their sales at 10 o'clock. That's the best time for them to do their sale. If they do all their sales at 10 o'clock, they get an enormous speak in their database. Not this little peak like shown in this picture, but a really tall one. When you do that, your database becomes your bottleneck. And a lot of times, what they have to do is schedule their sales based on database capacity. They'd like to do their sales at 10 o'clock. They do their sales, their sales all day long because their database is a problem for them. Uh, how many of you know the reference? No, I don't. Anybody else? Want to take a shot? What happened in November 2012? Some guy not far away from here had an application which was database driven. And the database didn't quite scale and it cost him an election. Anybody now? Okay. Uh, it's now reasonably well known that one of the things which didn't work for uh, this gentleman was his system, Orcot. Was, uh, oh, oh, it was Romney, right. Yes. Right. It was a database which was not able to scale for him. The other folks had a... <laughs> <laughs> we will not go there. No. We can do that at lunch or dinner. <laughs> uh, but the, the reality is this. The, uh, the internet, the web, 
Most of the applications you see there, they have a database of some kind, uh, some kind under the covers. Very often that database is a relational database. There are people who use non-relational technologies as well. But very often it's a relational database. And if your application is successful and reaches scale, this could be a real problem. Um, so of course, that's not a hard problem to solve, right? Just cache the whole thing and you're done. Um, put a CDN in front of your site, use memcached, use some other thing like that, you're all good. Uh, the problem you have with that is the web is not a read-only place anymore. Uh, if you look at this site or the news site, they want interactivity. They want you as a user visiting the site to provide them feedback. Uh, even something as boring as a weather site likes interactivity. They want you to post your picture of Hurricane Sandy. Guess what that is? It's a write in the database. If you have a write to a database, your caching layer is not going to help you because your database eventually needs to commit that data someplace. Uh, so yeah, caching is going to help you with some things. You try and satisfy some of the reads on the, uh, on the CDN, you try to satisfy some of the reads with the cache, but for some things you still have to get to your database. Um, the other reason why databases, even in a read situation, become a bottleneck is this. Um, there used to be a time when you went to a site when you got the same thing which every one of your closest friends would get if they went to the same site at the same time. Now if you go to CNN's site, they have a cookie on your machine, it knows who you are, and they give you content which is tailored to you. That's not coming out of a cache, that's literally coming out of a database access somewhere. You want personalized content, you're not going to tolerate a site which says, hello user. It needs to say hello and your name. It needs to remember what you want to see. And the other thing about this, uh, this feature is, even if you don't log into a site, Facebook is effectively becoming your single sign-on for the world. If you, are, if you are a Facebook user, and there's a few of us here who use it, you have a cookie of, on your machine for Facebook. Many sites know who you are. But therefore, there's a database access there as well. So, yeah, caching done point work. So, I guess the question is, what do you do about it? Well, one answer is get a bigger server, of course. Up to a point, that will work. Um, how many of you are running an application with a database in the cloud? Any cloud? Private, public, otherwise? Uh, what's the largest machine you can get reasonably inexpensively in the cloud? Let's say Amazon. How many cores? How many? Comparable to the machine you would get in your data center, how many cores do you think you have? Four? There's six, two or something. Six cores, 24 threads. Um, the one you're talking about is the cluster compute server, yeah. which will give you the equivalent of about eight cores on a dedicated piece of hardware. They call it much larger number of ECUs. Um, Side-by-side -side performance benchmarks say that that server costing you about three bucks an hour gives you without reserving without reserving systems. So okay, so even if it's cheaper, it still gives you about the same power as a eight-core machine in your data center. Um, okay, so there's I can get a much bigger server in my own data center uh, if I wanted to. But if you're running in the cloud, the rest of your apps running in the cloud. There's a real limit on the size of the server you can get. Okay, so what else can I do? Uh, maybe I have too much data. Maybe you do, in fact, have to store less data. And that's not a particularly useful suggestion. Um, if your site is successful, you're going to have more users. So really the question is, databases a long time ago were built for scale up. In this world, where we want to go in a virtualized environment, you want to be in the cloud, uh, scale up's not really that much of an option. So what do you really do? And of course, you know, smart people have figured out that you can do this thing called sharding. Um, how many of you here have tried it? 
Tried sharding, used it. Okay. Um, basically, what's sharding? It takes all your database, all of your data, and it horizontally partitions it into silos of data. And somewhere in your application, you have logic which says, that query which I want to ask, which shard does it relate to? So, a practical example. I have data which is naturally divisible by, say, geographical region. North, south, east, west. I have four shards. So, four databases, each one with, let's say, approximately the quarter of the data. So now you have each database working with less data. Potentially, in parallel, each one is getting one-fourth of the queries. The downside with this approach is this. It's now up to the application to figure out, one, which shard do you want to send the data to? And if I ever want to ask a query which spans shards, well, tough noogies, that's your problem. Um, give me the top salesperson in the north zone. No problem, send it to the north shard, you're done. Give me the top three sales guys in the country. Okay. Each shard will give you the top three sales guys. Now it's left up to the app to figure out which the top three are across the country. Uh, some of us in this room were probably around when relational databases were still not so frequently used and people had very tight coupling between the application and the database. And one of the reasons why people came up with this whole notion of a relational database was they wanted to have a decoupling between the two. What sharding basically does is remove that decoupling and makes the application very tightly coupled to the data. If you ever want to ask a query which doesn't happen to match the way in which you sharded your data, well, you can start all over again. Uh, case in point, uh, Pinterest, which we listened to their presentation about sharding at, I think it was Procona Live, a couple of, about last year. And they spent one year several million dollars, no new development, and they came up with a sharding infrastructure. And the good thing about it was they got to do presentations at a lot of speaking slots about sharding. And then their marketing guys decided they wanted to do something slightly different with their, the way they monetized their system, and they had to do it all over again because they wanted to shard the data different. So effectively what you're doing is you're taking one big mass of data chopping it into silos, and then saying it's up to the application to figure out how you get the pieces to Okay, so maybe you can shard your data, maybe you can't. Remember, you can't always shard your application. If your schema is such, it may be that you can't shard it. You may have queries which do not work with shard. So, okay, maybe a partial solution. What next? So, another possible solution is you use one of the many new SQL, no SQL <coughs> style alternatives. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear about more of these later today as well. One of the things you've got to remember is many of these solutions have custom APIs. Okay? So you write your application to that API to the point of, like sharding, there's a tight coupling between the app and the data queue. Okay. The API is not standard, so if you happen to choose the wrong NoSQL, NewSQL solution, and you decide you want to change, well, you can start all over. Um, how many of these NoSQL, NewSQL style solutions are there? Uh, I actually did a very scientific experiment some months ago. There are more than there are Ben and Jerry's flavors. And we all know there's quite a few Ben and Jerry's flavors. The big thing about the NoSQL, NewSQL solutions, they tell you is they're horizontally scalable, and I'll buy that. They are horizontally scalable. Many of them are elastic, which is all good stuff. At what cost? Well, no standard APIs, no standard transactions. Um, some of them are not even going to guarantee durability. Because when you do your right, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Um, and some of them are just <coughs> science experiments. And Many of them work well as long as your data fits in memory. The moment your data goes more than your main memory, yeah, your mileage may vary. So if you are doing an application where 
you really expect your data gets to a database and stays there and you want to write queries against it, um, maybe this is not the solution. At, at, uh, I think it was DrupalCon in Denver um, last year, no, year, year before last, I spoke to a guy who said, MySQL doesn't scale, okay? So I wrote a plugin for Drupal to run everything against MongoDB. Cool, nice idea. Um, everything works, okay? Um, all the plugins, all the other modules in uh, Drupal work? Yeah, almost all of them work. Does the tag cloud work? Uh, no. Okay. Think about it for a second. Very logically, a blog or a website appears like a document. Document structure seems to make sense. You have pages, you have posts, you have content. Uh, and I'm sure that with his Mongo plugin for Drupal, or Mongo module for Drupal, his page shows were faster than Drupal against MySQL. I absolutely get it. Unfortunately, if you want to build a tag cloud, guess what you're doing? You're scanning the entire database. So this goes all the way back to you know, object databases for, from you know, a decade or two ago, where there is an, an access path which you, can act, which you can optimize the heck out of with an object database. But if you happen to have a query which goes orthogonal to that access path, you're dead. And some things just will not work. So, OK. Again, there's a class of solution, a class of problems for which these NoSQL solutions might work, but they're not always the case. So I guess the question is, what are your alternatives? And I'm here to talk to you about one, uh, which is an approach of elastic scalability, elastic virtualization. Uh, this is the product we built. It's horizontally scalable with standard databases, standard MySQL under the covers, completely horizontally scalable, total changes to your application, zip, zero. And the important thing is, it runs in the cloud where elasticity is really important. You pay only for what you need because you can spin up and spin down resources on demand. I'll, I'll show you a, a demo of this as well. So very simply, what it's all about is scalability, horizontal scalability, not reinventing the world with the net new database, and it has to be last. Um, so, I suspect the keynote just got done, right? Um, I was in the long call, oh. so they are just about to start, actually, they are on the page. Just about to start? I think so. Oh. They're probably about to start the next session. Oh, next session, okay. All right, so here's, here's what we do. That's your application on the left. That's your existing MySQL database on the right. And your application and your database communicate with you know, libmy. Uh, it's a PHP app. You use PDO. Uh, Ruby app, you have some mechanism to connect to a database like Active Record or whatever. Standard interface, whatever it is. What do you do with Power Elastic? Nothing. Swap your database out and put us in its place. No changes to your app, just change the connection point, connection URL. The important thing is you need to change nothing in the application and you get the benefit of Power Elastic. And I guess the question is, what is that benefit? So here's your application talking to us. No, by the way, same standard interface. You don't have to change drivers, none of that stuff. It looks like MySQL. You use the command line for MySQL. You use MySQL Workbench. That works too. Um, and behind the scenes, what we do is we distribute your data over a collection of databases. And by the way, when, when I'm done with the PowerPoint version of this, I'll give you an actual demo and you can see what this looks like. So we take your data and we horizontally partition it over some collection of servers. And for every table in your schema, we know how the data is supposed to be distributed. So when you send us data, we know where to put it. When you send us queries, we know where to get it from. And we can, we look at your query up here, and we say, oh, what are you trying to do? Uh, that query has to go to here and here. We'll do the query, we'll get you the answer. Very nice. Now, importantly, all we're doing, by the way, we process no queries of our own. We're not a database. 
be virtualized databases, we're not a database. We just make a group of databases work together like they're one big database. Fine. As your servers start getting full, we give you the ability to add more on demand. No need to reshard. Uh, for those of you who raised your hands when I said, did you ever shard? Uh, in a sharded application, you distribute your data based on some application defined rule. But if you add more servers, you very often have to go and reshard. No resharding with us. So how do you decide where to put data actually? Well, when you create your table or when you create your schema, you give us information about how you would like, as an administrator, you tell us how you'd like the data distributed. I'd like it distributed based on the values of these columns. I'd like this data to be transactionally consistent and replicated on all the servers. I don't care where you put the data. That's another option. I'm just ingesting a large log file. Put it wherever. I don't care. And after you do that once at DDL time, you never need to bother about it again. We take care of where we put data for you. But the most important part is unlike sharding, when you add additional servers, just add them. Keep going. You can add them high. Now, I didn't mention that in sharding, you get these silos of data, north zone, south zone, and so on. If with Paralastic, you issued a query which said, give me the top three sales guys in my entire, com in my entire uh, company, that sales guy or those top three may be on any one of these servers. There are some cases where we need to get data from multiple servers to work together. And in order to do that, we have off the shelf, again, MySQL servers with no persistent data on them. These can be spun up and spun down on demand. You have a higher workload on your system, spin up a couple more. Your workload on your system goes down, spin them down. We'll use them dynamically, and I'll show you that during the demo where we actually can add a server, use it, remove a server, and so on and so forth. And the important thing is, from the application's perspective, all of this stuff happens behind the scenes. You don't need to bother where the data is stored, what we have to do uh, to get the data to you, and so on and so forth. Last, but by no means least, You've got, uh, you've got the ability to add as many copies of our software as you want. You can scale these horizontally. You can scale the processing nodes horizontally. You can replicate data from each storage node to another copy. You can have multiple copies of our software. Again, there are no single points of failure on the system, but more importantly, each one of those additional servers gives you additional throughput, and I'll show you some performance numbers which tell you why that's useful. Um, any questions so far? Uh, yeah. So yeah. you say if you add storage, it doesn't move existing data. Correct. So are you saying that the user doesn't have to do that, or that the database actually the actual, Actually, move the data. database doesn't move any data. So, so what metadata are you tracking then? Um, Sherry, how much time do we have? Um, we have about half an hour. Okay. So, happy to chat with you in more detail about it. Uh, at the core, what we do is something which is like this. When the system had only three servers, mm -hmm. replicated or others, three logical places where you can put data, mm -hmm. um, we treat that as the first generation of storage. Mm -hmm. And we know what data was loaded into the system that point in time. More importantly, we know that it was not loaded into the system at that point. Allow them two more servers. Now we call this the second generation. When you give me a row of data up here, and you say, insert it into one of those tables which is distributed, I determine, or the software determines where to store it by looking at each generation one at a time and saying, was it seen in the first generation? Yes, no. Seen in the second generation? Yes, no. If it was never seen, I'll store it one way. If it was seen in some generation before, I'll store it the way it was stored then. Mm -hmm. 
seems like a very simplistic thing, but you start peeling the onion, you realize, yeah, this is a hard problem to solve, because how are you going to know all the data which you ever saw? And um, there's a 70 page, 70 page patent which describes exactly how we do this. Um, I used to work at Nikiza before this, which was a data warehouse company. We used to make a parallel database as well. And one of the things, yeah. So since you have a patent and you talked about making database copies and stuff like that, is this open source or is there, are there any open source components to this? There are no open source components to it. However, if you're a large enough customer and you'd like to uh, talk to us about a source license, happy to do that as well. Um, but no, it's not an open source uh, product. Uh, so the generations ever get collapsed? Like, so every, so every time there's an event where they add nodes, that creates a generation? But there are scenarios where generations can, in fact, be collapsed. Yeah. There, are, there are specific operations. The moment you buy into the philosophy of generations um, and, and things like that, there are very nifty things which you can do with it. Um, having to tell you in great gory detail how it works. The trick is not the notion of generations. The trick is how do you quickly determine whether you've seen something before or not. And that's the harder part. So is it like balloon filters where you try to be one of those? It could be one of those. Um, balloon filters will get you thus far, but there's a couple of other things which you have to go through before you can adopt balloon filters. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the real question is, if you buy all this stuff, how do you actually process a query? And I'll show you more examples in a demo, but here's a very simple one which I'll walk through with you. I got a table with customers. It happens to have 2,700 or so customers. All I wanted was to tell me how many there are. But realize that the data for the customer table is now distributed over a collection of nodes. Each node can tell you how many rows it stores. If you want to get how many rows all the nodes collectively have, you got to get this stuff from across multiple nodes. And for those of you who work with any parallel database, this is old hat. All we're doing is we're creating a place where we can store an intermediate result, just the way a database would if it was doing this kind of operation. On each of the nodes, we compute how many nodes, how many rows there are, and we stick them in that temporary table, and then we finally sum that to give you the answer you want. How many of you here have used MapReduce? Could do any one of those kinds of things. Look familiar? It's same kind of technique with standard databases under the cover. Okay. So what are the benefits? Well, you get parallelism from all of your storage sites. Parallelism, as we know with databases, and I'll show you some numbers in the next couple of slides, gives you a huge win. You also get the benefits of elasticity at the par elastic here. Also, I'll show you some uh, numbers for that and compute elasticity where you can add and remove resources on the fly. We'll see some of that during the demo. So what's this performance actually look like? Well, here goes. The line on top is a M1.4XL on Amazon. Uh, in this case, I just did a simple power test, if you will. Increase the number of users to see what the response time looked like. Well, that's native MySQL. That's 5M1 large which, by the way, is cheaper than one M1 for Excel. This is a response time, so lower is better. So what's important is not only is the, is the line lower, but the slope is flatter as well. And this just happened to have five nodes. You can grow this to more nodes, as we'll see in a couple of slides. The important takeaway is this. Large machines in the cloud are exponentially more expensive, and they don't give you proportional performance benefit. For exactly the same reasons that people love MapReduce and Hadoop and so on, parallelism gives you much better performance. Except we do this with standard databases. You don't have to reinvent new databases. We do it with standard SQL semantics, so we give you standard transactions and the whole thing. So, uh, the reason people use large instance types in EC2 or in general for databases is for the buffer. Yep. So even though you may have scaled out processing, if you, you still have to fit the working set. 
Correct. And that's typically the thing you scale out. For right. Purpose. So you scale it out, but if each of your nodes has less data, mm -hmm. the size of your working set required is also lower. Yeah, so certainly it means you can hit a different point on the sweet spot of where Amazon gives you RAM. Correct. Absolutely. And you can hit, you said, a different point, a different sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I'm hitting a cheaper sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that if I can get five machines which are cheaper per machine, but five machines as a whole are cheaper than one of the larger ones, I can get better performance, what's not to like about it? So you're measuring performance only as throughput, um, which is, or late, late same response time, but I mean, the, usually, well, actually, there's no, there's no generalizations, but I think most people, the, the primary termination response time is um, how, how much they fit in the book. Um, if I'm building a web application and I'm looking at a web app, I'm looking at a website, and I'm an app developer, would I be concerned about response time in my application, the happiness of a user? Okay, so you're a user of my web app. Do you care how much data I put in my buffer pool? Do you know what a buffer pool is? As a user? Yeah. yeah. So as that's that's kind of the trade. -off. I have to figure: Do I need to add more CPU? Because they could add more nodes and add more CPU, but not RAM, and still not get better performance. Absolutely, I, I absolutely yeah. buy your logic. Okay. Um, yes. The thing is, if yes, since Amazon, since every instance which Amazon gives you, which has CPUs, also has memory, um, you have more instances, you get more memory. By by that's one reason I'm talking about it is five and one large. I'm not talking about so many cores. I'm not talking about so many network interfaces. I'm talking about so many building blocks which cost less than one building block which cost more. That's all. So, so the M1 large is like that seven and a half gigs in memory. Four X large is fifteen gigs in memory. So you get a lot more memory. Well, those are cheaper. But most people, I think, who have a scale out problem are picking the nodes that have like 60 gigs of memory, whatever it is. That's correct. Yeah. And why are they doing that? Well, even when they're scaling out, they're doing that. Okay. So, so a really bad example to give would be like Netflix published how they switched Cassandra to the cluster computer when SSDs correct. when those came out. Mm -hmm. And they're still on a scale out system, but they're also cheaper for them to scale up mm -hmm. and have more RAM and more IO. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you still need to scale out. You, you still need to scale up. We're scaling up. We're scaling up cheaper. Yeah. We're doing it with standard databases, and I, I don't refute the fact that Netflix is you know, modestly successful with their approach. Modulo when Amazon shuts them down for you know, whatever reason Amazon chooses. Anyway, so what's the a couple of other things. Like you've got your information sharded across the databases. Mm -hmm. Is that, are you, do you have auto increments, different auto increment values in each one? So you have, like in a the table, there's a unique primary key mm -hmm. across all of these storage instances. Mm -hmm. so, and you, so you could theoretically do a MySQL dump through the thing to get all of your information back Correct. out there. Absolutely. To get a single view of it. Absolutely. Do you run, and so this is a test of a web application, mm -hmm. short transactions, mm -hmm. small amounts of results. Right. Do you see the same type of scalability with large results? Yes. Um, do we see, okay, so we've done limited testing of that ourselves. However, I can tell you about a couple of companies which do almost identical architectures which are modestly successful in the data warehousing space. Yeah. Vertica? Netiza, Exadata, Greenplum, Data Allegro. Those are all MPP databases for analytics. Mm -hmm. Each one's got a different twist. Vertica's got columns, part like car, part like cell. Netiza's got hardware accelerators. Exadata's got infinite band in the back end. Everyone's got a little twist on top of it. But if you think about Redshift in Amazon's cloud, it's a column-oriented version of this minus elasticity. Mm -hmm. So architecturally, this works fine for data warehousing. We're going after a sweet spot, which is more in the web app transactional space. We've done some work with the analytics space, but you want to use it for analytics. By the way, 
Or you dumping it out, like, like, have you done any work like dumping it out of the back end of this and into a vertica for the data warehousing? Why would we do that? We do it on our own. So if you take a spectrum of transaction processing and say, you got the high frequency trader here, mm -hmm. and you got the guy who's doing, you know, occasional heavy duty analytics at the other end. There's a broad middle which consists of OLTP plus reporting, mm -hmm. where on, if you go past reporting, you get into BI and analytics. If you go before uh, the transaction processing here, you get into high frequency trading. That broad middle is very well served by this one. It's scale out. It doesn't do sub millisecond or sub microsecond response times, which is what you need if you want to do high frequency trading. And it's not, don't confuse it with you know, an enterprise network. Um, I talked about the other point of elasticity, which is having multiple par elastic nodes. This is a kind of a confusing picture, but I'll try and explain it. One MySQL server, this red line is the very first chart I showed you. This is par elastic. The blue line here is par elastic with three copies of our software and five MySQL as in the previous picture. This is six copies of Power Elastic with five MySQL servers for persistent storage. Uh, the captions are kind of. If you extended this out, at some point you hit the nonlinear, did you not extend the number of servers? Uh, I have not gone much beyond a thousand because at, at some point. Um, at some point, I suspect the underlying MySQL servers will also start to go catatonic. But just add more MySQL servers under the covers, and you're fine. Sure, uh, we have that flexibility. But if you if you say I I will not add more MySQL servers, yes, eventually it is MySQL under the covers. It so will do exactly. So you expect to see some of the behavior that there. Correct. And and to your point. When I start to notice those kinds of things, I know I have to add more nodes. And those nodes are cookie cutters in Amazon's cloud. They're AMI, spin up a couple more, and they're all set. This entire operation of going from three servers to six servers and back, you can do it hot. No need to shut down. No need to move any data around. When your system starts to see more users or more data, spin up more, and you're in good shape. And that's the point of this curve, which is effectively the reciprocal of the response time as you're through. If I know my system is being hit about 150 transactions a second, by the way, this is a benchmark which will try to go balls to the wall. If you know your system is seeing 150 transactions a second, you can calibrate your app and say, yeah, three power elastic servers are good for me. And then you notice your transaction rates coming close to 150 and getting close to 200. You know you can spin up three more and you have headroom to go up to 350. Very predictable. Spin out when you want, spin them down when you don't. And that's my core way of trying to say you can do that hot. Just watch how your application is behaving. Spin up more or spin them down. No need to pay for a ginormous server. This, I guess, is the reason why I think the solution is, is more interesting. Because with a scale-up solution, in most cases, you end up paying for that cluster compute node, whether it's a reserved instance or not a reserved instance. You pay for it at all times, even if your system only needs this transaction level. If you have a system which has some level of variability, over time, this is much cheaper, especially because you have to change nothing in your application. It's the same app. And I'll show you that in the demo. So, just a quick summary, and then we'll look at an actual demo. Uh, I guess it's required at any of these events to mention we're also hiring. So <clears throat> we're local. If you happen to be from Canada, from the Toronto area, we have an office there as well. So uh, drop us a note, and here's some contact information for you as well. But at the end of the day, unmodified applications, standard databases, elastic scalability in the cloud. That's what we're about. Questions? Yeah, so um, from the MySQL client perspective, yes. do they talk to like a local proxy process? What do they connect to? Uh, so how, how would that topology normally look? 
Good. So that's your app, mm -hmm. okay. which talks to some address exposed through a load balancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so MySQL dash u username dash p password dash h. That interface up there. Mm -hmm. So, oh, so I'm not familiar with uh, Google putting load balancers in front of the database instances. Mm -hmm. um, so port 3306 is MySQL's magic port. Okay. And the load balancer is going to do whatever magic algorithm, like say round robin, and every incoming connection on port 33, it's TCP based. Okay. Every new connection is going to go to one of these four, or it's going to go based on number of outstanding connections or whatever. Okay. Um, and so the load balancer is a, okay, so the, 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 the database server processes, oh, that you're actually showing the, so load balancer is going to talk to a storage node or a processing node? No, they're going to talk to us. Okay, so we have our so the storage nodes, so the storage nodes are talking to MySQL over the wire protocol. I mean the, uh, the storage nodes servers. are MySQL. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry, terminology. So the, uh, our software servers. talks to MySQL servers over a wire. And so your software is running on dedicated servers? Whatever you want in the cloud. It, it could be a local proxy. You could use you could yeah. you could stick those servers on a lo on your on the same node as your application server too. You ideally want to have these processes close as, these processes mm -hmm. close to the MySQL servers. Okay. You can have them on the same server. You can have them in the same data center. Yeah, you can have them on your desktop. Mm -hmm. I'd rather you have them. Okay. So for Distributed transactions, so the database virtualization engine has to parcel the incoming SQL Absolutely. for a transaction. Absolutely. To figure out where stuff goes. Absolutely. Um, and so you do a begin transaction, you do a read on one node, mm -hmm. um, and then you do a read on uh, that ends up being routed to a second storage engine. Mm -hmm. um, do you let like, the storage engines manage the transactions locally, and then if there's like, a conflict, you just let the storage engine tell you? And um, effectively, we're doing standard distributed transaction semantics. Yeah. MySQL is XA compliant. Your storage engine, if it happens to be in ODB, you get standard XA for the price of using it. We do optimize a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One, if you're using MyISAM under the covers, yeah, your transactions are, yeah, they're, uh, ISAM doesn't support transactions. Yeah. Um, second, if you have where if you have a scenario where you come in and you say begin, you do an update which is going to hit one row in one place and nothing else, and you do a commit, we don't do a distributed commit. We do it right. Okay. So my other question is the separation between processing and storage. Mm -hmm. So um, why have a separation versus just adding more storage nodes and distributing the load that way? So because um, then you don't really have to ship the data. Or so one of the let's. <coughs> Um, these MySQL servers have standard MySQL storage engines under the cover. They could use Tokitech storage engine, they could use InnoDB storage engine. Each one of those talks to a file system. That file system is never shared. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you remove the replication part of this picture, this is a standard shared company database. Mm -hmm. Therefore, each node is going to execute queries based on the data it has. Mm -hmm. If you want to improve Right now, if I want to improve the throughput on my system, I either scale up compute nodes or I scale up parallelistic nodes. Because adding storage nodes only becomes relevant for new data. Mm -hmm. Because I can, okay. add, I, can add, I can add seven more of these subjects down here, and they have no okay. data. They're not going to give you much better. But how much load are you really offloading in a processing engine? Because the real load is the scan and having to potentially do it. The beautiful thing about MySQL, or MySQL and Postgres for that matter, is if you are doing scans and you're doing relatively few things like joins and aggregation, and if you're not muddying the buffer pool, same buffer pool, and you're cache friendly on your index, these things can scan like crazy. MySQL is a wonderful key value store. Facebook has proved that. A lot of the processing does get offloaded here. Standard database semantics, the way in which you would like to operate your system, is distribute your data in such a way that the vast majority of the fast path queries are going to be done fully in parallel. Yeah. Data is co-located. However, 
you can't always guarantee that all the data is going to be co-located and you can do it in parallel. There are going to be costly queries <coughs> which will benefit enormously from this. And I'll show you an example of that. So in, in practice, the, the trade-off is uh, there's a class of queries which benefit from them, and the benefit they get is well worth the, uh, the difference in the architecture. Yeah. So do the processing engines typically get used for like analytic type queries, not for reporting, not the product stuff? No, lots of lots of queries will do that. Give me the top three sales data. So that's that's more of a reporting part. Uh, a web page tends to have yeah. things like that because I have a limit clause on it. It becomes top three. Yeah. It's. But you but so you're saying if someone asked for the top three, would Power Elastic? Would it actually get the top three from each storage node and then take the top three from that That's each correct. time? That's correct. So the, that becomes a distributed transaction. So mm -hmm. that why is it a distributed transaction? Well, it's you're doing you're doing a read at every single uh, shard of the database. Correct. Right? Correct. And so that's not going to be linearly scalable. There's a point where you can't do that anymore. Like even if you add more storage nodes, processing nodes. So actually, actually, it, uh, I don't have a slide for that, yeah. but. Uh, it turns out that that is also linearly scalable. Are you going to be using your laptop and trying to do a present, uh, doing a demo? A demo? No, I'm just doing a demo. Just slides. Okay. He's going to use the projector. Though. I'm trying to find out where I can put this in pipe and look at people and also not pull the cord before. Okay, um, you have about 10 minutes, by the way. Yeah. So you can actually scale that and happy to show you uh, more slides which talk about that. Um, but yes, if, even if you want to just scale for the purpose of that query, mm -hmm. having more storage nodes, that's right. Okay. So the, it, it, well, the top, materializing the top three is just a, a peak at the beginning of the year to index on the top, right? So it's kind of, you all you get when you add more nodes is you have to read from more places before you can actually get it yourself. Okay. So actually adding more nodes makes that kind of query slower because it's just distributed by nature. It has to visit every shard. Um, in parallel. But the look at the, it, the thing is it's there every, every node is the exact same amount of work. It just peaks at the beginning of the index on the yeah. column. Unless you're actually scanning the entire data set. How about we take but that like, one offline because okay. the numbers seem to prove well, thank you very much. Ray. So, oh, that's not an issue. Let me cite the same thing right here. Uh, okay. It's about as much as I can maximize my screen. So what you're seeing here is the, the user interface to uh, the web interface to our product. Web interface is usually a whole lot easier to demo than going to a command line. So I figured I'd do that. Um, very quick overview of what we got here. Uh, you got a user interface which shows you operations a second. And importantly, the one in the lower part of this picture shows you various dynamic nodes on the left. Persistent storage sites on the right, and uh, so to talk to that. We've got in this picture five persistent sites. They're on five different servers, by the way. Just to make sure that we don't have port conflicts, we bump MySQL and my.cnf to 3307 because we take over 3306. Those are the persistent sites where the data is actually distributed. We've got five dynamic sites here. And we'll talk more about policies and stuff like that in a second. But to get started here, um, what we also have is a couple of standard Drupal blocks which are running against Power Elastic. And you'll notice that in order to render this page, um, which is our big data block, which if I hit refresh here, will cause more traffic to the database again. And again, 
that database traffic is going across a couple of sites, five in this case. We have a couple of um, similar websites which we set up. Standard unmodified Drupal, um, just to, to illustrate the point that you don't need to make any changes to your app. And each time you do that, you get some amount of traffic on the database. Okay. It's a, it's a distributed database, therefore multiple sites are going to take part in each of these operations. Whenever a query comes along, we completely deconstruct the query, and one of the things which we decide up front is, how many of these dynamic sites do we want to actually use? And we decide based on a very simplistic method. In this particular case, the way it's set up, there's a policy which says, I can use either one, three, or five dynamic sites, and I set it up this way just to show you uh, what would happen in, in various of these cases. Um, and oh, by the way, I go provision those at execution time. I just pick them out of a pool, and that pool is managed by some independent mechanism which can spin up and spin down more resources on demand. And we'll spin up one here just to show you what it looks like. Um, of course, it's much easier to demonstrate this with a simple query tester. So we have this um, query tester interface. Um, nothing going on in the system right now. Let me close those blogs just so we don't get anything showing up in the middle. Uh, simple query like, um, let's say, run the query. That query goes to all of the sites, sends the results over to one dynamic site, you sum them, yeah, you get the results. There happen to be six, six rows in this table, relatively small site at this point. Um, but it illustrates the point that when you run a query, you can get the results from each one. Um, how about we run a slightly more interesting query? By the way, this schema is the schema for a standard Drupal, data, uh, Drupal website, so Select the node ID and the node title when the node ID is less than 20. <coughs> okay. I don't need any dynamic sites for this. I can just go to the storage sites and get it. And I get the node ID, I get the title, and so on and so forth. Um, the reason why parallel databases are, are a little bit interesting are if you distribute the data, in this particular case I distributed the data in such a way that the tables being joined, in this particular case, node and field data body, are not distributed for a parallel join. So you'll notice we did some work on each of the storage sites, and then we did a lot of work on all of the compute sites in order to produce that result. We're a standard MySQL style database, so you can get an explain plan for that. Here are the actual steps which would be executed in order to execute that query. Uh, explain plan is a little bit hard to start with this one, so let's start, say, with this. So what's the plan for that look like? Well, redistribute and get the count from each of the nodes into a temp table, and then go to that temp table and get the sum, which is what you want. So at the end of the day, all we do is we take this input query which you came up with, turn it into this execution plan which some MySQL servers can execute, and we give you the results. Okay. So I executed this query here, and I want you to take a look at what happens. You'll notice that in order to execute that query, Notice that there are five dynamic sites being used here. The reason for that is on this policy I said use only five. All right, let's go change that on the fly because I decided I want to have one more. Uh, let's call it, say, and let me just put it on the first one.
Okay. I got one more site now I could use. Shows up here. It's available. It's online. Let me just go and update the policy and say yes, I can use six instead of five. And now, if the gods are going to smile on me when I rerun this query, it should use all six. And it did. This one here. Spin up resources on the fly, use them on the fly, okay, I'm done, the spike in my activity is gone, I'm going to get rid of that guy, um, highlight it, delete it, yep, delete it, remove it in the policy because now I only have five left, let me make it four, because I figured the load came down even more, let me go back here, hit run, I only use four. Depending on your workload, you change the amount of resources you have, and you have a database which is horizontally scalable, no changes to your application, and you pay for exactly what you need. And happy to chat with you more about the performance, but uh, the numbers which I showed you, they're in the, on these slides which are on our web page. Go ahead, take a look at them, and if you're interested in trying the software out, give me a call. Thanks.